The Lord be with you. Friends, welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church. Welcome whether you are viewing us at home on your laptop or tablet. Welcome to everyone here. If, uh, if you can't see at home, we have a nice group here today, our first time for our soft opening, our regathering, and it is such a joy to see the faces of our church family. Uh, this is, this is uh, just such a blessing to look out in the congregation. And again, I'm not sure what can be seen on, on film or not, but it's, uh, we want to welcome everybody and just praise God for being back together and starting our process for regathering as a church congregation. And then let me talk about that just for a minute. Uh, today we are having our soft opening today and next week. And what that is is a time when we're still filming the worship service, uh, but we are also in inviting people to come as they feel comfortable. That's going to be important as we regather in the coming weeks and months as a congregation. Everybody's comfort level is different, and we have to respect that. Just as any family has different needs and concerns within a family, a church family is the same way. And so we don't want anyone to feel any you know, undue pressure. Uh, we love everybody. There's, there's such a great spirit of uh, unity in the church. We want folks to feel comfortable to come when they can, and it is so good to see everybody who's able to be here today. Uh, we have masks uh, and gloves and hand sanitizers throughout the sanctuary, offering plates in the corners, and we're trying to do everything we can. The pews are, are spaced off for social, social distancing. And, uh, and also just to thank you for your uh, comments and your returns on the survey. I've read that survey multiple times, always looking at it to glean more information. And your comments, your suggestions have been really appreciated. And I ask you to keep, keep them coming so we can know how best to minister to you. So this week and next week are soft opening, and we are looking toward June 21st, Sunday, at our regular time of 1030 for our regular opening then. At that time, we will be live streaming. And so here's a, here's a matter for prayer. Pray that Comcast, the signal gets better. We have Patrick and Jim Frederick and Timothy Gibbs have been working on this problem for us. Uh, we would have been live streaming the whole time except we couldn't trust the signal. So we're praying by the 21st we may have, we may have a solution to that. I want to sh share some other announcements with you. Uh, remember way back when we were, let's see in here, we were doing our baby bottles of blessings. That was supposed to be collected on April 5th. It's way past April 5th. We're going to set a date for these. We want to make sure we do it when there are enough people here. This is a new beginning uh, to support New Beginning Pregnancy Resource Center. This is their biggest fundraiser, and uh, it's a great organization, pro-life and pro-eternal life. And so we'll get to that. We will get to that. Folks have been also asking about how they may help the Farley family, Buck and, and Allison, you know, uh, experience that uh, fire. And... Um, uh, right now, uh, we're just saying that probably meal cards would be good as they start to kind of sift through and sort through and, and uh, get going again. Uh, they surely appreciate it. So if you have any questions, you can see me or Jill. Also want to share today uh, and congratulate Bill and Linda Craig. It is today, right? Is their, tomorrow, tomorrow is their 51st wedding anniversary. So just want to congratulate them. <laughs> Bill, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds what is good, and I believe blessings from the Lord. So you can certainly testify to that, can't you? You can. So blessings, congratulations. Uh, anyway, you can look at the rest of our announcements uh, in the bulletin. If you have any other questions or concerns, please always feel free to contact me. You can email me, you can text me, you can call me. And if you'd like me to come over for prayer, you know, again, just seeing everybody face to face is so wonderful. If, if you've been missing that, I'll sit six feet away from you. I'll sit in the yard while you're inside. If you just want a time for prayer and maybe reading the Bible together, more than willing to do that, just let me know. And I'd like to invite everybody to join uh, with me in our call to worship and those with us today to stand as we, as we share together from Philippians. Sharing about our Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Philippians 2, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, our opening hymn today is All I Have is Christ. Let's praise God together.
I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, a sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would find a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place, you bore the reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is Well, hello everyone. It's really good to be here today. It's good to be out. The past three months have been unlike any other time in my life. First, the COVID-19 pandemic, and now over the past week, some of our most beautiful cities across the country going up in flames. Small businesses and lifelong dreams destroyed all set ablaze by the tools Satan uses to divide us. Anger, fear, hate, and violence. But we must never forget who we belong to. We must look at these events through the lens of Christianity. As Christians, we are called to care for the sick, the hurting, and the broken. 
Jesus left us with this simple command, love one another. Do you find yourself feeling anger or feeling fear as you watch these events unfold on television or the internet? For those sins and others, we pause now to confess those before God and ask for forgiveness. Would you pray with me, first silently and then corporately aloud? Heavenly Father, we confess that it is hard for us to understand grace. We are uncomfortable with the thought that there is nothing we can do to earn your favor and forgiveness. And so we are always looking for subtle ways to justify ourselves. And yet grace testifies to your great love for us, a love which was manifest in Jesus Christ. As your word says, even though we were dead in our transgressions, Christ loved us supremely, dying on the cross to take away our sins. And so help us to realize that grace is not a vegetation to keep sinning, but a testament to your kindness and love. Give us strength then to respond to this grace by repenting of our sins and living with renewed obedience and fill us increasingly with the Holy Spirit, that gratitude may overflow from within us for the favor we have been shown all our lives, and the favor which continues to carry us now, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now Patrick Hall will come up and lead us in Jesse's children. Well, good morning. Well, this morning, John is going to give us a sermon on a tax collector or tax collecting. And so I thought, who is one of the most famous uh, tax collectors in all the Bible? Well, obviously the shortest, too. It's Zacchaeus. So let's hear a story about Zacchaeus. It's titled, The Man Who Didn't Have Any Friends. Any, not even one. It's from Luke 19. There once was a man who didn't have any friends. None. Do you have any friends? Well, of course you do, but not Zacchaeus. Poor Zacchaeus didn't have any. You're probably wondering why. Was it because he was too short? Hey, I'm short. I've got plenty of friends, so that can't be it. Well, that's not a reason, like someone would say. What, 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 is it because he had a hard name to pronounce? Zacchaeus. I don't think that's either. No, his name, although it was funny, that wasn't it. People didn't like Zacchaeus because he stole their money. Zacchaeus collected taxes. Taxes were what people had to pay the king. But Zacchaeus took more than he was supposed to keep, and he kept the extra money for himself, and that made him very rich. Everyone knew what he was up to, and it made them very cross and grumpy. They didn't like Zacchaeus one bit. So they made sure he knew it by doing things to avoid him and walking the opposite side of the street and pretending not to see him and whispering things like, there is that somebody who nobody likes, loud enough so he could hear. Anyway, one day, a huge crowd gathered on the road. Jesus was coming to their town, and everyone had one wanted to see Jesus. Zacchaeus wanted to meet Jesus too, but everyone was too tall. He tried jumping up and down, but that didn't work. He couldn't see a thing. Luckily, Zacchaeus had a good idea. I'll climb that sycamore tree, he said. So he did. He was surprisingly good at climbing trees for a man who was unusually short that he had to take up flying just to get into his chair in the morning. From the tree, Zacchaeus had the perfect view, all the way down the road. Another minute, and suddenly Jesus was there at the tree. He stopped and looked up to Zacchaeus. He saw him, and Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Jesus said, I'd like to come over to your house. Zacchaeus almost fell out of the tree. 
come over to his house? No one ever wanted to come over to Zacchaeus' house, let alone come to his house and eat a meal with him. These people saw this, and needless to say, it made them even crossier and grumpier than usual. They mumbled and murmured and muttered, Why is Jesus being kind to that big sinner? Doesn't Jesus know about him? Zacchaeus scrambled down and took Jesus into his house. He was in a big hurry because he didn't want Jesus to change his mind. Perhaps Zacchaeus thought that Jesus didn't know about him stealing from people and why no one liked him and why he didn't have any friends. But Jesus knew. He knew all about Zacchaeus and stealing and his, his bad behavior, and he still loved him anyway. Zacchaeus was ashamed. Lord, he said, turning pale, what I've done was so wrong, but I want to do the right thing now. I will give all the money back to everyone four times what I stole. And that is just what he did. Jesus smiled. My friend, he said, today... God has rescued you. Jesus loved Zacchaeus when nobody else did. He was Zacchaeus' friend, even when no one else was, because Jesus was showing people what God's love was like, his wonderful, never-stopping, never-giving-up, unbreaking, always-and-forever love. The end. Would you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we are so grateful for the lesson of Zacchaeus the tax collector. We're so grateful that people could learn to look past the things that he had done wrong to them, not because of who he was, but because of who you are. Lord, remind us that no matter what we do, that we're always loved by you. And Lord, let us remember this lesson that we should always forgive people, even when and especially when they don't look like us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to thank Patrick and uh, Susie and, uh, of course, Faith and David, our worship team today. Also, to uh, in addition to Bill and Linda celebrating their anniversary, Patrick and Rebecca uh, celebrated their 15th anniversary this week. Uh, Kelly and Shane are another couple who are celebrating a fifth anniversary this week, and it's really wonderful. You see that range, five years, 15 years, 51 years. Um, God is good, and God blesses us. You know, as we're here today in the service, it's... Uh, Again, if you're watching at home, you probably can't see it, but I just have this overwhelming desire to jump down from this place and hug everybody here today. Not going to do that, uh, but it's coming. It's coming. So just be prepared. Well, uh, during this time, it's been a very kind of crazy time. It's hard to, uh, hard to get traction or keep traction. And I thought during this time, uh, kind of an informal study on the parables would be really appropriate because the parables can each be seen like as, as standalone uh, things. You don't have to build on them from week to week. Uh, and the parables are interesting because just when you think you got a clue on them, you look at them um, and you say, well, that's it. And then all of a sudden you see it from a different light and you say, well, wait a minute, there's more to it than that. Uh, I know we've got Reverend Randy Tate here. Randy, you've seen that same way with the parables, right? They're like, they're slippery. They're like trying to grab a fish and it kind of, you know, just when you think you got it, you say, wait a minute, there's, there's more to this than that. Um, I'm not a puzzle person. Uh, my wife loves jigsaw puzzles, uh, but I do enjoy taking a parable, looking at it, trying to figure out what it means and trying to find the depths of it. And again, it's like, like peeling like maybe an onion. There's so many different layers to it. And, and we've been looking at different parables through these weeks. Now, today's story uh, it's only found in the Gospel of Matthew, and it does involve uh, tax collecting of a sort, but that's not the point. In fact, when we share the scripture together, you're going to say to yourself, wait a minute, that, that's not a parable. How is that a parable? It is a parable, and we'll explain how that goes. But it's interesting that it's a very whimsical uh, story. It only appears in Matthew's Gospel. I will bet you haven't heard it preached many times or studied many times but really has a deep message for us today about who we are in Christ, who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. Now, interestingly, in Matthew's gospel, we are at a point, uh, we're looking at Matthew 17 today, but we're at a point in Matthew's gospel where Jesus' identity is being progressively revealed or coming into focus. You know, I have, I have my reading glasses here. If I look down at my Bible right now, I can't read those words. I just see different colors, the, the black and then the red for Jesus' words. I put the glasses on, 
and they come into focus. And in fact, this week I told Faith, uh, you know you're getting old when your Christmas gifts, part of my Christmas gifts this year were Faith got me a bunch of reading glasses <laughs> and including one that's higher power than this. And I actually had to use those. For some reason, it wasn't coming into focus this week. I had to put on the even higher power. But you put them on, they come into focus. And who Jesus is has been coming into focus gradually throughout Matthew's gospel. So for example, in Matthew 16, it's Peter's great confession of Christ. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's right, Peter. And Peter doesn't quite get it yet, but, but he's on the right track. Uh, Jesus begins to predict his death from that point on for the first time. And then comes the story of the transfiguration, where they're on the mount and Jesus and, and, um, uh, appears with Moses and Elijah before Peter, James, and John. And again, it's like the curtain of his glory is pulled back. They get to see who he is. Again, it's, it's becoming more uh, clear who Jesus is. And then today in the story of this temple tax, it doesn't seem like it. But if we dig deep enough, there's going to be a, a, a real way we see this is, again, a revelation of who Jesus is. So I invite you now, wherever you are, here or at home, to share with me in God's word, taking from Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. It said, after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Well, yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. And by the way, another reading of that, I think even a better reading says, then the sons are free. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we pray now thanking you for your holy word the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the most holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Well, before I start, I'll share that I uh, have a little story here today. And uh, all through the week when I was thinking about the story, it made me think of you, Greg. Uh, and you'll see for obvious reasons. But there was a... Uh, there was a minister once, a pastor, who was a really, really big outdoorsman. He just loved to go fishing. But it seemed like the only days the weather had been good lately had been on Sundays. All week long, it's really bad. Sundays, it was good. And of course, Sundays, for obvious reasons, was the one day of the week that he couldn't take off and go. Well, comes again another week in the forecast again. It was lousy all week, but for Sunday, it was forecasting a beautiful, beautiful day on Sunday. And, and you know, he really wanted to go fishing. And so, you know what? He decided, this minister, he was just going to play hooky that week. And so he called one of the church elders, and he told him that he was in bed with the flu. And he asked him to preach in his place. Now, he kind of felt guilty about it, but the next morning he was up bright and early, loaded up his tackle box and his line and his poles, and he drove 50 miles to a secluded little place where he knew nobody would ever recognize him. But up in heaven, though, there was an angel watching over what the pastor was doing, and, and he was kind of bothered by it, so he went to the Lord, and, and God agreed something should be done about this. Well, you know, the pastor's line hadn't been in the water very long when he felt this, this, just this tremendous tug on it, and his heart started racing. And for over an hour, he ran up and down the riverbank fighting the fish. He just sweat began pouring down from him as he battled with it. And at the end, when he finally landed the monster, it turned out to be a world record king salmon. I mean, he had never seen such a beautiful fish. But as the angel up in heaven was watching it all unfold, he, he became confused. And he turned to the Lord. He asked, Lord, why did you let him catch that huge fish? I thought you were going to teach him a lesson. But God replied, I did. Who do you think he's going to tell? We know our gospel lesson today has its own fish story to it. And, 
And this story, really, this story is a story that's meant to be shared, but it's a, but it's a strange little story, really, because what we have here, whether we realize it or not, is actually a parable, but it's a parable that's not so much spoken as it is acted out. Now, this, this idea that a parable doesn't actually have to be spoken is it really isn't as strange as it seems. You know, we know parables are stories, but of course stories occur all sorts of ways. For example, in the book of Hosea in the Old Testament, the Lord commands the prophet Hosea to marry a woman named Gomer. And Gomer isn't exactly, well, let's just say she isn't exactly the kind of gal you bring home to dear old mother. Fact is, I mean, there's no other way to put it. She, she's pretty loose. She's got a reputation. She, she gets around. And, and things don't get any better once Hosea and Gomer tie the knot. In fact, Gomer ends up bearing three children, and there's every reason to believe that none of those kids, that Hosea isn't the father to any of them. And then after that, there's just one affair after the other, multiple affairs, until Gomer finally just takes off and leaves for other lovers. She just gets right up and leaves Hosea, which should have been the end of the marriage right then and there, right? But God commands Hosea to go after his wife and bring her home again. In fact, in Hosea chapter 3, it says this. This is Hosea speaking. He said, the Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me for many days and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will live with you. And so basically, Hosea, the prophet, has to go and buy back his cheating wife, which, which has to be absolutely humiliating if you think about it. But the reason God commands all this stuff, and it's really strange, is because he's painting a picture of the Israelites' relationship with him. God is illustrating their spiritual unfaithfulness and how patiently he puts up with all their adulteries, even though he is willing to redeem them still, if they're willing. And so this, this picture of the prophet married to the prostitute is a parable. It's a, it's a living parable. It's a real life picture that's supposed to shake the Israelites up and get them to realize how far off in their own relationship with God they had come. And that's just one example. You know, the book of Jeremiah, we find another example. The Lord commands Jeremiah to purchase a field. Just as Jerusalem is about to be conquered by the Babylonians and the people carried off in exile, in fact, you can almost hear the Babylonians. They're at the gates. They're, they're pounding the gates. They're setting fire to the city walls. And God says to Jeremiah, yeah, I want you to go buy that field. Get a deed to it. Get title to it. And of course, that makes no sense. I mean, who in their right mind pays for real estate that you know is immediately going to be taken away from you? But God commands Jeremiah to buy the field anyway as a sign. It's a sign of hope, a sign that one day God promises to bring his people back from their captivity and a sign that through it all, whatever they experience, that God is faithful. And again, it's a parable acted out rather than spoken. And it happens all the time in the Bible. So, so God communicates through actions as well as through words. And this is what we find going on here in our lesson today. Jesus and his disciples recently returned to the town of Capernaum. It's the northern edge of the Dead Sea. It's kind of their home base of operations. And once they return, Peter is approached by collectors of what was known as the temple tax. And they ask, they want to know, whether Jesus pays the tax or not. And Peter immediately replies, well, of course he does. But before we go on, it's important to understand what this temple tax was and why it's so important to our story today. You see, we go back to the book of Exodus, way back after God had led the Israelites out of their bondage in Egypt. And the Lord, we know this, he, he gives Moses a series of rules and rituals that are supposed to govern the people's lives as a new community. You know, they're coming out of Egypt, they're a new community. Uh, you know, this, this orders their life and it honors God. And so God gives them things like the Ten Commandments, you know, rules we know, but he gives a whole lot of other lesser known rules and rituals they're supposed to keep. A lot of those we don't know so well. But one of these were what was eventually became known as the temple tax. And in Exodus 30, the Lord commands Moses that when a census is taken of the people, all males, 20 years old and older, were to pay a half shekel 
as a symbolic ransom or atonement for their lives. And that the money collected would be used to support the service of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, of course, was sort of the portable tent of worship, of meeting there in the wilderness that came before the temple. So, so this command is pretty straightforward. You know, all males 20 years old and older are supposed to pay a half shekel as a ransom or uh, an atonement. Uh, but, and this is important to remember, very important. The purpose of this tax wasn't simply to pay the bills, you know, even though it was going to be used to support the tabernacle service. That wasn't the purpose. Instead, the Lord tells the Israelites it was to be given as a ransom and as an atonement for their lives. In other words, this half shekel tax, whether it was given annually or only once in a lifetime, and we really don't know which, which it was, it was a reminder. It was an important reminder. It was a memorial of their absolute dependence on God. It was a symbolic gesture acknowledging how God had redeemed them out of their bondage and that God alone was the one who sustained them. And so it had a deeply significant theological meaning beyond just being used to fund the upkeep of the tabernacle and, of course, later the temple. It was really about acknowledging their complete dependence on God as Savior and as their Redeemer. Now, whether it was still seen like that in Jesus' day uh, or how strictly it was observed, you know, it's another story. We're, we're not quite sure. All we know is that the collectors of this temple tax approached Peter and asked if Jesus pays the tax. And, and it might have been a legitimate question. I mean, the, it was certainly a tax the Jews paid, and it, they didn't mind it as much as paying the Roman taxes because it went to support the temple. It might have been a legitimate question. Or the tax collectors might have been using it as a test to gauge sort of how supportive Jesus was of the temple. In other words, how Jewish, they wanted to see, how Jewish was Jesus really? Did he, did he support the Jewish temple and all the, uh, all the customs and, and the law of Moses? So it might have been a test, we don't know. But Peter, I think, if we, if we kind of read between the lines, Peter senses a bit of insinuation in their voices, and so he immediately rushes to Jesus' defense, insisting that of course he pays the tax, although truth is, he's really not sure. And it all puts him in a very awkward position, and it leaves the question up in the air. Now, of course, the simple thing for Jesus to do would have just been to pay the tax and be done with it. In fact, if he just reached into his pocket and pulled out a couple of coins, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. But there was really a bigger picture that the Lord wants to get across, and the bigger picture was that he wants us to see there is more at stake here than simply paying a local tax or not. You see, this is all about the radical reorientation that Jesus inaugurates by his coming. And to illustrate what he means, Jesus asked Peter a very simple question. And the question is, do kings, do they tax their own sons or others? And of course, everybody knows the answers. Kings don't tax their own children. That would be ridiculous. Taxes are levied on other people, on servants. They're not levied on sons. You wouldn't tax, for example, your own estate to benefit your estate. That wouldn't make sense. Everybody knew that. And so practically speaking, it was a no-brainer. But Jesus wants Peter, and he wants us to understand that it goes even deeper than that, much deeper. That there is a relational dynamic here underlying the whole thing. You see, sons are exempt they're free. And the reason they're free is precisely because they are sons, because of their relationship to the king. And I remember someone sharing a story about a friend of his whose family owned a video arcade some time ago, when video arcades were a thing. And uh, my good friend, whom some of you have met know, Reverend John Hartman, his father actually owned a video arcade when John was a teenager. And John confirms with me he did the same thing, and I'm going to share with you now. But but, you know, uh, if you're a young person listening today to the sermon, uh, you need to know that uh, when, when we were kids, people of a certain age, you know, we didn't have Xboxes or, or Playstations. There was no, none of this soft, cozy, easy stuff. Sitting home in front of high-definition flat-screen TVs with your game controllers, right? Back in our day, we had to rough it if we wanted to play video games. We had to literally walk 10 miles in the snow uphill both ways to go to arcades where there'd be a dozen of old video machines and pinball machines lined up around the perimeter. And it was all very primitive, of course. And of course, you had to pay to play a quarter at a time. 
But for that quarter, and I wonder if any of you here remember that or anybody listening, you, you, got, you got things like Pac-Man, remember? Or Donkey Kong, or Asteroids, or, or, or Galaga. And you could keep playing those games as long as you kept winning, or as long as you had a steady supply of quarters. You know, I never had either, and so I didn't spend a lot of time in video arcades. Uh, but this guy says his friend's family owned their own roller skating rink slash video arcade. And what they used to do, this family, was they used to take stacks of quarters and paint them green. And then they'd give these green quarters to their kids to use in the video games so the kids could play whenever they want. And then later, when the parents, the owners of the arcade, when they'd go and clean out the coin boxes, they'd collect all the painted green quarters and they'd give them back to their kids so the kids could play again. And then they'd just re keep recirculating those painted green quarters. And when I asked Reverend Hartman about that, he said, yeah, we did the same thing. We used red, we painted the quarters red. And the idea here being that kids would get the quarters back because in some way they were really, you know, part owners of their parents' establishment. It was the relationship that made the difference. It was all relational. And this is what Jesus wants us to understand. As the true son of the father, he's free, he's exempt. The temple tax doesn't apply to him because the temple belongs to him. It's actually built to point to him. He shares in all that belongs to the Father. You know, it's like what I tell my kids. I'm, I'm not a wealthy man. God's given us what we need, but I'm not wealthy by any means. But if there's anything left after Faith and I pass away, we've told our kids, it all goes to them. It's not even a question. Everybody gets the equal percentage. What, whatever we have is theirs by virtue of the relationship. What's well, this relationship with the Father? This is what Jesus comes to share with us. Through his life and death and resurrection, Jesus is making a new family. And it's a family based on faith, not on ethnicity, not on religion, but based on relationships. And it's by virtue of that relationship that we get to share in the blessing. You know, it reminds me of a scene uh, in the movie The Blind Side. Anybody here ever see The Blind Side or at home? I, I like them, a fun movie. Uh, Blind Side's about a young man named Michael Orr, who eventually went on to play in the NFL. Uh, but Michael Orr, who's befriended and eventually adopted by uh, the Tui family. I believe it all happens in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, now, Michael Orr is black, and he's from the inner city. He's from a broken home. Uh, the Tuies are white, and they're wealthy. They live in a mansion in the suburbs. And through a series of encounters, they get to know Michael Orr, and, and they take him into their home. And they fall in love with Michael, and they eventually become his legal guardians. And one of my favorite scenes in the movies is where the father, Sean Tui, he tells Michael that he can go to any of the dozens and dozens of Taco Bell restaurants he owns in the Memphis area. He can go to any one of them and eat for free. Anytime, anywhere, just like his two biological children. And one day, Sean Tui gets a phone call at home from one of his store managers who says that there's a very large black man there claiming to be his son and wanting to eat. And of course, Sean completely surprises his manager by confirming that Michael is his son. If not by race, then certainly by relationship. And if this, it's this kind of relational dynamic that Jesus invites us to share now, one in which we share in all the rights and privileges of the kingdom because the son gave his life to share his sonship with us. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, get this, it's a since you are also a son, God has also made you an heir. An heir of eternal life, an heir of every blessing, an heir of everything good in Jesus Christ. You see, by laying aside his own freedom, by not asserting his rights and privileges, Jesus brings us into the family of God. You see, by telling Peter that They'll go ahead and pay the tax anyway. Jesus is doing what he doesn't have to do. And you know, the way he does it even testifies to who he is as the true son through whom all others become sons as well. I mean, look at the story. Jesus doesn't merely fish around in his pocket for a shekel to pay the tax. Instead, what's he do? He tells Peter, you go fishing. And that the first fish he catches will have a coin in its mouth for the exact amount they need. Now, I'm not much of a fisherman, but that's never happened to me or anybody else I know. And it is one of the most comical 
whimsical scenes in the whole Bible, but it's there for a point. You see, Jesus isn't just doing parlor tricks to impress his friends. The intent of this miracle is to demonstrate his authority and to give his confidence that what he says is true. For example, you might remember there's another miracle Jesus does, very well-known miracle, where he heals a paralyzed man. Man is brought to Jesus. He's lowered through the roof by four friends and, uh, and laid in front of Jesus. And if you remember that story, the first thing Jesus does is he actually doesn't heal the man's uh, paralysis. First thing he does is he forgives his sins. And of course, that causes an uproar. The people standing there, they, they, they're scandalized how this person, this, this person Jesus, whom they perceive as just a mere man, how he can forgive anybody's sins because only God alone can forgive sins, they think. And they're right. Only God alone can forgive sins. But in order to prove that he has the authority to do just that, to forgive the man's sins as God, Jesus also heals, heals the man's paralysis as a sign of his power to forgive. And this whimsical little miracle here, this coin in the fish's mouth, it functions the same exact way. In order to show that he's the true son of the Father, Jesus does what nobody else can do. And in order to share his sonship with us so that we might become children of God too, he does what he doesn't have to do. Not only by paying the temple tax, but by giving his life as a ransom for ours to save us from our sins. You see, if you remember what I said earlier about the nature of the temple tax, the true nature, it, it, it wasn't there just to pay the bills. Remember, it was a symbol of God's redemption. But ultimate redemption would take place when Jesus offered his life on the cross for ours as payment for our sins by laying aside his freedom. So as the scripture says, we could be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. The freedom that he holds out and offers to each one of us today. You know, Maxie Dunham is the former president of Asbury Theological Seminary. He tells a story of a uh, pastor, Reverend Roy Smith, popular Methodist pastor, preacher, and writer who grew up in the Kansas Plains in the early part of the last century. And uh, Reverend Smith's father worked in a flour mill and never made more than a few dollars a week. And so as Roy grew up, they grew up with not a lot. And um, as he grew up more than anything else, he wanted to just be able to go to college, and especially this little Methodist college in their hometown. But he knew, he knew it just wasn't possible. They simply didn't have the money. And yet somehow it happened. Somehow his parents were able to scrape up enough to save money and send Roy to college. Well, apparently Roy did well early in his academic career. He was selected to be part of the school debate team that would have him standing up on stage. And he, he desperately, since he'd be in public on stage, desperately wanted a new pair of shoes for the occasion. But again, he didn't see how that was possible. But once again, out of their meager resources, Roy's parents were able to buy a new pair of shoes for their son. Well, the day of the big debate came. And just before Roy was to go on stage, he received the urgent message that his father had been injured in an accident down at the mill. And so he bolted from the auditorium. He ran as fast as he could, but by the time he got there, his father had passed away. Well, after the funeral, Roy went back down to the mill to collect his father's belongings, and someone had thoughtfully collected everything he had, and even placed his father's old work shoes bottom side up in his toolbox. And when Roy opened up that toolbox, first thing he saw there were those shoes. Shoes that had these wide, gaping holes in the sole. And in that moment, it all started to make sense for Roy. He realized that while his parents scrimped and saved, so he could be standing on that stage in brand new shoes, his father had been standing almost barefoot on the cold steel floor. And then he'd done it all for him. We know as Patrick always says when he gives the benediction, remember he always talks about him who walks on wounded feet. And, I, and I, I love that, don't you? I love Patrick's benediction. He always concludes it by mentioning him who walks on wounded feet, feet which were nailed to the cross, not because he had to, 
but because he chose to. Because he chose to take those nails for us so that we could have what was uniquely his. A place in the family. Not as servants, but as sons who are now part of the family by virtue of our relationship with him. Thanks be to God for the Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, our Father, we thank you for the true Son, through whom, Lord, we are all adopted as heirs into this incredible grace which Jesus made possible on the cross. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you the glory. For the Son shared what was uniquely his, Lord. Jesus did what he didn't have to do so we could become part of the family of God. And so, Father, here in our hearts is gratitude, Lord, that's silently expressed now. And let us realize, Lord, that even when the evil one accuses and accuses, and, and just tries to make us feel guilty, Lord, that we are part of that family, Lord, by virtue of Christ, and that his sonship is now ours. Father God, we thank you, and we praise you for your grace. It's so good to be here today, Lord. It's good to be here with others after this long, long pause. We pray, Lord, for our church, and we pray, Lord, for healing from this virus. We pray, Lord, for healing from all the violence and strife that goes on in our nation, Lord, and that the truth and justice of Jesus Christ would prevail, Lord. Not man's justice, but your justice, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be shiners of the light, salt and light in this world, pointing to the one who alone can save. And Father God, we thank you now, we praise you, we give you all the glory lifting our voices as one people, praying the way Jesus, our Savior, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to join me now our closing hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. me mm-hmm.
says, why should I gain from his reward? But the answer is right there. How deep the Father's love for us. This is why we gain from the sons, from his reward, from what he did for us because of the deep, deep love of God, a love that surpasses anything that we can ever imagine or experience in this life and something we have eternity to soak up in and rejoice in. And now, friends, may the grace and peace of God our Father be with you the joy and salvation of Jesus Christ around you, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep you, the love of God surround you this day, this week, and forevermore. In the most holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. <laughs>